us to have Ken Bottenfield come and, and share with us um, a lot because uh, he uh, did something that as a kid I dreamed of and, and hoped that I could do, and of course I wasn't able to accomplish, but um, more importantly because I, I just relish opportunities for especially kids who have the dream that I have as a, as a little boy to become a major league baseball player. To really be able to, to hear from someone who achieved that dream, um, how we can put that in perspective. Because as, as great and awesome of an achievement as that, that is for those who get to that point, it, it really pales in comparison to the relationship that we can all have with Jesus Christ. Because the, concept, the, the implications of that are eternal. Um, careers in sports are short, but our career with Jesus Christ is eternal. And, and I'm so excited for Kent to be able to share with us today uh, the testimony that, that is his uh, because he made that all-important decision to follow Jesus Christ. Um, I, I also want you know to mention tonight that I wanted to go on record. I don't know if we're taping today, but... Um, yesterday I got to play in a softball game and I got two doubles off this guy. So <laughs> that to be done. Nobody needs to know how slow he was pitching it, but you know, I can say now on my resume, I got two doubles off the former major league pitcher. Uh, Ken Bottenfield, uh, uh, as we have mentioned before, uh, not only played in the major leagues but achieved a very high level. I think it was 1999 pitched in the major league all-star game. It's one of the pinnacles uh, of, of Every uh, baseball player's career, they have that opportunity to do that. So it's with great joy and the humble heart that I invite Ken Bockfield to our platform to share what God has laid on his heart. Do well. Thank you. <clears throat> you grew up with a nickname, a hoss. Is that right out of the uh, bonanza? No, the, uh, well, yeah, it is, but it started actually, I don't, let me ask you a question. You want me looking at you? Just yeah, that's like, fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Uh, the nickname actually started when I was with the Cubs. Uh, when I got called up with them, I noticed on the rooming list, the first hotel we went to, that there were all kinds of aliases on there. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would do one to be funny because the guys in the bullpen would call me Haas. And so I became Haas Cartwright on the rooming list, and it was <laughs> it was funny. Except for some people, family and friends, when the, when they wanted to get a hold of me, they had to ask for Haas Cartwright uh, when they called the hotel. And so some people had no problem, had fun with it. Others were like, "Can you please change back to your name?" <laughs> but you know, you really you, you needed it because if you if you had your name on that room, there were times early on, people would call my room from the street below asking for tickets right. in different towns. Or, or whatever, and it's like, who, who are you again? Right. Oh, you don't know me. I'm just wondering if you can. And so it was only a way to kind of protect, because they call 7 o'clock in the morning, and for a baseball player, that just doesn't cut it. Right. So um, it, it started off as kind of a joke, but I, I kept it all through the rest of my career, and it was actually quite a help. <laughs> Did other people have aliases? Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, but I can't tell you what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you have to shoot me. <laughs> you're born in Portland. Uh, were you born into a Christian family? I was. We were the kind of family that was in the church every time the doors were open. Yeah. Uh, and I heard the gospel presented different occasions, but it wasn't actually till I left home, uh, my first year of professional baseball, that, that I received Christ and, mm -hmm. and made that relationship my own. When as you were growing up, did you get a sense, did you, I mean, you're a big boy, did you get a sense that obviously athletics were going to be a part of your life? Oh, they were. I mean, I started playing baseball when I was four years old. Right. Uh, and I just kind of followed my brother's footsteps who played football and basketball, and he's not as, as big as I am. And, and, uh, but it just it became apparent, especially in baseball, uh, I threw harder than all the kids. I had a pretty good idea of where it was going. Uh, and it was a dream of mine from the time I was about 10 years old. I can remember my brother, who was four years older, uh, he came home from uh, baseball, and one of the guys at the high school was just drafted, I think, by the Red Sox. 
And I can remember we shared a bedroom, and I said, that's going to be me someday. And he laughed at me. And to this day, he'll say he didn't laugh at me, but I, you know, a 10-year-old doesn't forget things like that. <laughs> but he laughed at me, and uh, I said, you go ahead and laugh. I said, that's going to be me right. someday. And, and it was uh, about six, seven years later. Other siblings other than your brother? I have uh, also two older sisters. I'm the baby mm -hmm. in the family, and they all still live out in the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, and I get out there to see them once or twice a year. You're working your way through high school and you, people are starting to pay some attention to you. And uh, was it difficult, first of all, was it difficult to decide which of the sports you were going to be part of? It wasn't. I, I knew what my best chance was professionally, at least I thought I did uh, uh, right away, was baseball. I had the opportunity to go to college and play football and play basketball okay. also. Uh, but I, I, there was just something about baseball. Uh, the one every five days that I was on the mound was just, compared to the other sports, was, it was the greatest. Uh, I didn't necessarily enjoy all that you had to do in football to get ready for one game a week. Uh, in basketball, I probably knew that it, you know, eventually it was going to run out. I mean, I was a, for my size, I was a pretty fast guy, fairly quick, but not compared to what they play in, in major college. And so I guess it was, Baseball was my first love, and I knew it was my best opportunity. The day uh, comes, and, uh, and somebody approaches you and says, "Do you were you? By the way, were you drafted, or was there, was there a free agent?" I was drafted. I was drafted in the fourth round by Montreal. Tell me about draft day. <laughs> Did, you know your your anticipation. There's a sense of anticipation. Did you know it might be Montreal? Did you know? I had no idea who it would be because I was being looked at by at least 15 of the organizations. I can recall pitching in a, uh, a game before the state playoffs, an exhibition game, and there was another player on the other team in Corvallis, Oregon, by the name of Brian Champion. I was the top pitcher in the state. He was the top player. And I, every time I threw a pitch, there were at least 15, maybe 20 radar guns that would pop up from behind home plate. And so there were a lot of teams represented there. A few of them had talked to me. They're not, I mean, they're allowed to, at least at that time, they were allowed to, to have a conversation with you, but. I can recall one organization in particular. Uh, they said we want to. We're interested in signing. Would you sign for X amount of dollars? I said no. I, I won't do it. I mean, my big thing was to make sure if baseball didn't work out, I had enough money to go back to college. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't anywhere near that. I think at the time, I think it was ten thousand dollars they wanted to give me, which is a lot of money. But that didn't cover what I wanted to accomplish if baseball didn't happen. Right. And uh, I remember he basically chewed me out that I had some kind of an attitude and I'll never get any more than that and this, that, and the other. And uh, So that was a very interesting thing to handle as a 17-year-old. Right. Uh, kind of scary. Uh, but when draft day came along, I had no idea. I mean, I knew that the Cubs were very interested. Uh, Montreal, I knew they had some interest, but it, they didn't stand out by any means. Kansas City uh, and draft day happened. We just sat around and waited for a phone call because at that time, it wasn't like you could watch every round on the internet or watch it on TV and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was an interesting time, and I'm trying to think if the fourth round happened in the first day. I, I can't remember. I think it did. But uh, we got that phone call, and I was thrilled. Montreal was a great organization. I mean, they were known uh, for being a great minor league organization at that time. Uh, so I was really drafted into a good place. Gary Hughes, was he with them <coughs> Yeah, I sure was. And Gary, was he the, the top scout? What was his role? <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Want some water? <coughs> that would be good. Hopefully you're going to be able to be editing in this. Don't watch this. <laughs> Dave Dombrowski, they, they all would spend a lot of time here because they actually owned the, the club. Right. Uh, and your first year, you had a little relationship with James Dunn as well. Do you have much recollection of that? Well, this was the first place that I came after the draft. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this is the first city I came to after I was drafted and actually came with my brother, my older brother. He was signed as a free agent uh, out of college. And so we came here together for basically at that time they had a mini camp. And it was, I think, 10 days or a couple weeks of just them getting to know what the players were all about. And, and then they separated us. And I ended up, along with my brother, going down to Bradenton, Florida, which was rookie ball. And most of the older players stayed here in Jamestown to continue. When you were here, how long was it? A week? Do you remember? It was it was a week, maybe two. Yeah. 
So as you worked your way through the uh, Expo organization, uh, what did you think of the, of the organization? It was, a, it was a rather aggressive one. It seemed to be one where there was a lot of player development at the time. We had a lot of successful player development. Was that your sense also? The organization at that time was great. I mean, it was probably, uh, along with the Braves, they were, we were known as the two best organizations as far as developing a minor league system. They had some great people in place. You mentioned Gary Hughes. Gary was very knowledgeable, uh, and he was very personable, too, which you don't always find in, in that position. Players really liked him a lot. He could walk around and get along with everybody, and that put a lot of guys at ease, uh, so that was nice. But they were just, they knew what they were doing. When they took a high school kid uh, such as myself, they weren't thinking, we've got to get him there in three years or four years. I mean, they wanted to make sure I went through the process, learned all the things that I needed to learn, fail in the minor leagues so that my first sense of failure wasn't going to be in the major leagues. Uh, I th I th they just did an excellent job, and I think they turned out some great players. Ended up being a lot of great players for other teams uh, eventually, yeah. uh, just because Montreal couldn't keep a lot of them, but uh, a, a great organization. Who were some of the guys that, as you were going through the system, you, you recall who perhaps went on to a, a su success in the majors? This is the expo. Oh, well, I mean, just I can think of a lot of teammates that I had in Marquise Grissom and Delano DeShields, uh, Randy Johnson during spring training, uh, Mel Rojas. Um, man, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. It's like the list goes on. Brett Barbary mm -hmm. was another player. Uh, we just, it just seemed like every team, and when you look back, every team had these guys that eventually went on the big leagues and had some success, and that was just a testament to how well they ran their minor league system. Unfortunately, once they got to the major leagues later on, it wasn't run so well, and uh, they started paying the price for it. You walk into uh, uh, Olympic Stadium? Yes. First time, that's, that's day one of your major league career. What did you think? It was overwhelming to me. Um, I, my, my very first start in the major leagues was actually in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and which was very interesting because uh, part of the riots had happened back in 1992. Montreal was in San Diego, and they were scheduled to go up to L.A. for three games. That all got canceled. Mm -hmm. And they were made up as part of three doubleheaders in July of that year. Well, I, the pitching staff couldn't handle that many games altogether, so they were calling up minor league pitchers to handle some of the starts. Well, I was one of those guys. And so that was my first taste of the major leagues. Then when we got to Montreal, we were in the middle of a pennant race in 1992. I mean, we were right there with, with the Pirates. And there were 40, 45,000 people packing that place. Um, it was an amazing time. We ended up falling short, but uh, it was a great experience. And then it seemed from about that time, maybe a year or so later, things started falling off in, in the city. You had a chance to have as your battery mate uh, in your early years of Montreal, Gary Carter. What did he mean to you? A lot of things. It was one of those things where I knew when I got there, I didn't have to have a mind of my own at first. The best way to learn was whatever he put down to throw. Mm -hmm. And I had great success uh, that when I got called up in September that last month, and I can attribute most of it to him because he was calling the pitches. I was just trying to hit my spots. And then he was also important to me, too, because he'd take me along with uh, Tom Foley. That we'd go out to lunch, and they'd have their Bibles with them, and we'd talk about Scripture. And, and so they really helped me from a spiritual standpoint, too. They were, uh, they were bold in their faith, mm -hmm. um, and they were willing to help a young kid along and, and learn some of the ropes. And so it meant a lot to me, and, and still keeping. Where he was on the mound, you know, in Jamestown, and was, did not play here, but he was sent off. I think I may have mentioned that in his Baseball Hall of Fame speech, he referenced Jamestown yes. as his first place because had everybody here in Jamestown scrambling. <laughs> <laughs> really? No kidding. How could we miss Gary Carter? But that's, that's what happened. Uh, you also had a unique game. Wasn't it uh, maybe even Gary's last game? Did you, did you pitch that? I was a starting pitcher for Gary's last game, uh, and I asked him before the game if I could have a ball. And so the first pitch that I threw, he rolled it out uh, to the bat boy. And after the game, he signed it with a personal message uh, to me. It was, it, was, it was special. I mean, it really was. I mean, for him to do that, here's a guy played for, what was it, 20, 22 years. And here I'm just this young kid, young punk coming along. Uh, but he cared enough about me and to help me along. And that was something that he did. I thought it was great. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but it was just caught it rolled it out, and that ball was just for me, and I s obviously still have it today. 
And you knew everybody knew that that was his last game. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. Was announced ahead of time. Yeah, and he actually, he hit, he hit. I think game tying, or maybe it was a go-ahead run. He hit a double that game to right center field. Okay. Uh, I think we won that game two to one. Terrific. Do you remember your first win? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't. You know, I was never a, uh, I was never a big stat guy. And I, I will guarantee you there are people walking around this earth today that know my stats better than I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can remember some prominent ones, uh, but I just something I didn't keep real close tabs on, and uh, I, I don't. I, I, I'd have to think through. You know what? It was pro it was against it was against the Cubs, and I can't remember if it was in Montreal or in Chicago. I pitched against them both places, mm -hmm. pitched well, but I think. I think it was in Chicago. We'll have to look it up. <laughs> Those early days, inevitably there was an event or two which uh, you might recall that was a, kind of a, either a, a bizarre thing that happened to you on the ball field or a funny thing that happened to you or an embarrassing thing that happened to you. Do, do you have that, that little vignette in your mind that says, oh, Greg, you're not going to believe this? Well, I can remember my very first Major League Spring training. Here I am uh, at, man, how old was I? 19 maybe mm -hmm. and I'm there with you know Tim Wallach and Tim Raines and Galarraga and all these guys and I'm pitching and, and I'm actually it was it was odd but I get a chance to hit in spring training and we're playing I think it was the Phillies Larry Anderson is pitching and Larry just throws nothing but sliders and uh, so Dutch Rennert is behind the plate <coughs> umpiring and we get the count is uh, I think the count is 2-2 two, two, whatever it is I've got two strikes on me and Larry, of course, throws me a slider. I didn't know at the time that was all he threw, but I see the pitch. I know it's a strike, and Dutch would scream everything, whether it was a ball or a strike. He was just loud. So he screams, and I'm walking back to the dugout, and I notice people are kind of laughing, people in the stands, and Tim Raines is on deck, and I get to where he is, and I, I look up, and he goes, he goes, Bot, he goes, you're still up. I go, what are you talking about? Because that was a ball. <laughs> so people are laughing. I've got to walk all the way back. And as I'm digging into the box, Dutch says, you let me call the balls and strikes, boy. <laughs> Next pitch, I look at it, the strike three. <laughs> but I waited. <laughs> I wanted to make sure. <laughs> so that was a little embarrassing right off the bat, but it was, it was good, all in good fun. Dutch was great. As you sat on the bench, or did you see some things that you said, I've never seen anything like that before? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, there's plenty of those things that you can talk about and things you can't. But right. uh, it's it's uh, it's just a whole different world. And I, I think essentially because even though a player is no different than anybody else, a lot of people don't approach it that way. So people can tend to to act differently. Uh, if maybe if they're wanting an autograph or they figure the only way they're going to get your attention is by doing this. Or so you you see some some interesting things. I know in, in Florida uh, we were playing the Marlins and somebody had a laser some from the stands, one of the laser pointers going through the dugout. And it, you can have a little bit of concern with something like that and, and I'm, you know, I don't get into worrying about a lot of that kind of stuff but mention something to the security guard in the dugout and uh, I'll tell you what, it wasn't even five minutes. They had that guy figured out and he and his buddy were gone. I mean yeah. they were sitting about ten rows up near the first base dugout and uh, they were out of there. So uh, one time I had a, a fan in San Diego. He was sitting for five innings and didn't budge, and he was staring at me. He wouldn't blink. He wouldn't anything. It became unnerving. And I can recall after the game, the way it was set up where the bus was, fans had not, they couldn't get to the bus, but they had access. They could see where you were and all that. And I can remember leaving the stadium, my head being on a swivel, looking to see, is this guy still hanging around? Is there something going on with this? So, you, you know, you, you face some interesting situations. Your first kid comes up and asks for your autograph. How'd you react? It was, uh, it was interesting. And it was, it was actually, in the major leagues, it was... Uh, it was in Los Angeles. It was my first start against the Dodgers. And uh, I, my parents were there, my wife was there, family members. Uh, and I think it, it tickled my mom more than anything. You know, I'd had it happen in the minor leagues, but most of the time it's your hometown team and, and everybody knows you because it's smaller towns normally. 
But to be in a place like Los Angeles and have somebody come up and not being in uniform and they recognize who you are, I, it was it was strange. Uh, but I, I, like I said, I think my mom was uh, she found it more amusing than I did. I mean, she loved it. So yeah. I standing there and probably for five minutes signing for different people. Um, just one of those things you think about as a kid. You want to be a major league baseball player, and that comes with it. But when it starts to happen, you want you start to wonder why why. Why do they want my name on a piece of paper? Why do they want my autograph? Yeah. Um, but tried to do as much of that as I could because I knew, you know, fans like that kind of personal contact, and I did too. And that was one of the things that I that I didn't like about the game was there were so many ways that you were separated from the fans. And then it was always I did a lot of uh, video work, especially later in my career, and and obviously lifting and running and all those things. And it was trying to fit all those things in and you know there's always going to be the last person that you sign for because you've got to get in and do this and you always want people to understand that, that I'm not I'm really not trying to duck you here I've, I I need to get in uh, and that was the hardest thing for me because there'd always be oh just one more just one more and you just don't have time for that one more um, so a lot of interesting interesting facets to the whole autograph thing and the videoing you're talking about is just simply watching your own mechanics and, and learning from that? Is that what I actually thinking? very rarely watched myself. Uh, what I started in Chicago in 1996 was uh, Phil Regan started, uh, I can't remember if he taught me in 96 or 7. See, that's my memory. He was Fergie, was, Fergie Jenkins was there in 96. Phil was there in 97, I think. We'll have to look it up. But <laughs> in 97, I believe Phil taught me to watch video. And he taught me, he taught me to watch myself and what I did against certain hitters and that was big because then I started spending a lot of time in that room. When I got to St. Louis, I started watching other hitters. I would go in every day uh, to Chad, our video guy at that time, and I would have circled in the paper, these are the games I'd like you to tape. And they were pitchers who were similar to me, uh, through similar pitches. Greg Maddox, Pete Harnish, Bobby Jones, um, probably had about six different pitchers. And so he, I would have them tape games, record games of teams that I was going to face any time throughout the year. It didn't have to be the next series. I just wanted to have those teams on file. And so we had a library of hundreds of games by the end of my two years there in St. Louis. And I would watch, man, I'd watch anywhere from 15 to 20 hours in between starts. Oh. Uh, I, would I would make sure my hotel room had, at that time, VCR uh, set up uh, so I could watch them on the road. Uh, I'd watch them at home. I'd watch it at the stadium uh, in St. Louis, and uh, you know now they've got everything on computer. Uh, so at the time I couldn't watch it on an airplane, but I guarantee you I would have uh, if I could have. And they've got it broken down. They have an amazing video situation in St. Louis now, and these uh, companies have these programs that are phenomenal. And you can break down, you can pick any hitter in any count all year. I want to see Ken Griffey Jr. and what he does 01 all year long. Boom, and there it is. Uh, man, I had to, you know, fast forward and yeah. do the whole thing. Uh, but it was a, it, it is what turned my career around. There were a lot of people, or not a lot, but there were some people that accused me of cheating because there was a, such a turnaround in my career from early on to later. Um, I always took offense to of that because I went above and beyond. I mean, if I had a ball that was given back to me that was scuffed, I would give it back to the umpire. Uh, and so those, those accusations hurt a little bit. But what it was, it was just becoming smarter. It was right. being a student of the game. Dave Duncan helped me a great deal with that. Um, and I, I started pitching differently than you're taught all the way through the minor leagues and, and what's the traditional way to pitch in certain counts. And uh, my head is still full of all that, and I don't have an outlet for it right now because my son, we're just trying to figure out mechanics right now. Right. Uh, but it, that was the big change for me, was, was becoming a student of the game. Were there other ones, other ones doing this, or were you? No, because you find so many pitchers, and I'm, you know, this is six years ago when I was playing, but a lot of the pitchers that I was around, they were so concerned about their own mechanics, and not that that's not important, it is. Uh, but they wouldn't think about, well, they know, well, if it's an 0-2 count or it's this count and there's runner on second, less than two outs, this is really what you need to do. And so you'd have these general scouting reports for players, but they weren't real specific, and that would come even from pitching coaches. I mean, so I've, I'd heard reports where, Okay, left-handers down and away, and right-handers up and in. And I'm thinking, okay, you've got eight different hitters over there at least, and whoever's on the bench, they don't all hit the same. Right. Um, you got to dig a little deeper than that. Uh, and 
So I did, and uh, I had specific reports on, on every player. I knew them as well, if not better, than they knew themselves. And I can recall uh, Tony Gwynn coming into St. Louis, and I was watching recent games of Tony, and I was, I was drawing marks on the television screen to see if they were just, if they were pulling off or whatever they were doing, just inches. And uh, I noticed that he was, which was rare for him, he was having a little bit of a struggle. I wanted to know why, one of the greatest hitters of all time. He was tending to pull off pitches. And so I spent the game putting him in a situation where I felt like I could throw the ball away and get him to pull off and get a ground ball someplace. And it worked. Um, and that's not a testament to me. That's just a testament of any pitcher that has an idea of how to throw strikes, if they just pay attention and, and really study and take the time, but you know, a lot of guys don't want to take that amount of time. It's not a passion for them. It's it can be a job, and it's not that they don't work hard, but they work hard physically, and sometimes that mental side gets pushed aside. You really hit uh, hit. Uh, <coughs> I suppose the, your first six years in the major leagues, you you won 18 games, and then in 1998. You won 18 games. So 1999. I yeah. Next, I assume that was that was a question people asked. You know. It was, but if they if, if people would have paid attention, and I wasn't much to pay attention to for a while, but in Chicago, um, and this is one of the stats that I kind of remember, when I came up as a relief pitcher in 1996, I was actually closing games in Des Moines. I was almost out of the game. I was about ready to take a job in in Taiwan uh, until the Cubs came and rescued me. Uh, they turned me into a closer in AAA and saved 18 games in like six weeks or something like that. And so went up with a, just a, an, and I'd been a starter my whole career. And uh, went in there as a reliever, very aggressive mentality. Uh, pitched well. I mean, I pitched in, in the time I was there from June, maybe 10th or something, the rest of the season. I had to have pitched in probably more games than a reliever. I think I ended up with 70 some odd innings. Uh, and an ERA below three, I think two six or something like that. And then the next year, uh, I had another good year, uh, ERA I think in the low threes. And in Wrigley Field, it's not, you know, I wasn't a total ground ball pitcher. For ground ball pitcher, tremendous park, mm -hmm. especially at that time. They kept the grass high, um, but I wasn't a total ground ball pitcher. So I had two very good years there. And that happened because the mental started coming along with the physical and then got to St. Louis and it started getting better. Well, partway into the season, uh, they approached me and said, we want you to start. And I had, I had kind of reclaimed a name as a reliever and was and causing a bit of a stir as, as a good relief pitcher. I'm like, no, I, I don't want to. And they went away and came back a couple of days later and basically said, sorry, we signed the checks. You're going to become a starter. What do, you, what do you do? So we did. And I pitched very well as a starter. Uh, we had some, I'm not one to point fingers, but we had some bullpen issues in 1998. And I left uh, a lot of games with leads and decent leads that uh, we weren't leading when the game was over. Let's put this back. My first start in Chicago against the White Sox, interleague play, uh, five innings. I don't think I gave up a run, but we were winning by seven runs with one out in the ninth. And you know, we, I was in the clubhouse, and guys were shaking my hand. His first win as a Cardinal starter, and on and on, and boom, 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 boom. And all of a sudden, we lose the game. And uh, so there was a fair amount of that kind of stuff going on. But I was pitching very well. Uh, I remember in spring training that year, I made a comment, and I wasn't one to speak out a whole lot, especially in the newspaper. And I basically told somebody I, I knew I was fighting for a job, even though I'd pitched well. And I just made a comment to a writer. I said, if I I'm allowed to start if I make this rotation. I'll win 15 games for this team. And I knew that not because, not just because of what I learned or what I did, but the team seemed to play very well behind me because I would work quickly and, and I had an idea of what I was doing and they enjoyed playing behind me. And so it's not that players don't always give their best, but when there's a guy that they trust and is working faster, it's just that little bit of extra energy. And uh, Tony LaRussa approached me the next day and made a comment and said that's a pretty bold statement and I told him exactly what I just said to you. Right. So I got in the rotation and uh, ended up winning 14 games before the all uh, it was it was just an incredible and, uh, it was it was just an incredible got a chance to go pitch in the All-Star game to me and I'm biased but one of the greatest of of all times 1999 at Fenway and they bring Ted Williams out uh, to the crowd uh, just an amazing moment. Um,
And as in any such relationship, there was honor. The honor for the Boston Red Sox to host the 70th All-Star Game and the last of the 20th century. Every day around Boston and at Fenway Park during All-Star Week was new, fresh, and exciting. This one could be over with him. To me. The All-Star Game shared top billing with another Ted Williams flair for the dramatic. That came when he was introduced as a member of the All-Century team. Please welcome the greatest hitter that ever lived, number nine, Hall of Famer, baseball legend, Ted Williams! Although he played in a different era, during a time when ball players left their gloves on the field between innings, the 1999 All-Stars, knowing they were in the presence of a legend, spontaneously yet reverently approached the greatest hitter who ever lived. It was obvious that Ted Williams basked in the moment. It turns out that John Updike was wrong. Gods do answer letters. It just takes a while for the message to come home. It was just a very, very proud moment to be part of baseball in Boston. And I was so proud of how our people did that day. You know, not just in, in putting on the game and producing the show, the flyby was terrific, but the, in, in the way that Pedro Martinez performed, I mean, that was just awesome. You know, Pedro was out there on a mission and he was going to show that he was the, the greatest pitcher in baseball. Tell me about that. I mean, you're sitting um, in the dugout. I think it was it was after the introductions, and they bring him up, because it is a very poignant moment. Yeah. Uh, what were the players feeling at the time? I mean, oh, it was electric. I mean, it was, uh, we didn't know it was happening. I mean, you would have thought we would have, but we had no idea what was going on. And we, you had some of the best players from the last 50 years lined up around the infield. I'm standing next to Tony Gwynn, uh, which if he wasn't in uniform, he'd have been standing right out there with those guys. Sure. Um, and, and, this, and this happened, and the crowd, it was just amazing. I mean, it, they had, here he comes out on the golf cart, and it flash bulbs everywhere, and they come around and to the pitcher's mound. And it was just, it's just one of those things, I don't know, one of the greatest moments I've had in the game. Uh, just being there for part of that and I know the fans loved it and so like I said I'm biased but it was to me a tremendous all-star. In the season we ran into the renowned baseball analyst Bob Ryan. I when the, uh, we were watching the all-star game. When it when it was hard not to be misty. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it was a, it, one of those things that had they scripted it they couldn't have, it never would have worked. Yeah. It was totally spontaneous, it was a wonderful moment and at that moment when it was over uh, they, the PA announcer could have said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Drive home safely, yeah. because there was no need for a ball game. Here, top billing with another Ted Williams flair for the dramatic. That came when he was introduced as a member of the All Century team. Please welcome the greatest hitter that ever lived, number nine, Hall of Famer, baseball legend, Ted Williams. Although he played in a different era, during a time when ball players left their gloves on the field between innings, the 1999 All-Stars, knowing they were in the presence of a legend, spontaneously yet reverently approached the greatest hitter who ever lived. It was obvious that Ted Williams basked in the moment. It turns out that John Updike was wrong. Gods do answer letters. It just takes a while for the message to come home. Chance come out in the fourth inning and uh, pitched against uh, not bad guys. Tomei, Ripken, Palmero, Rodriguez, Alomar, Lofton, Jeter. Uh, just being on the mound against those guys has got to be a thrill. Yeah, that was an interesting time for me because I had, on Sunday I had just pitched in San Francisco and, and threw six or seven innings. And when I got to Boston, Bochi called me into the office and he said, I know you just pitched Sunday. Do you want to pitch? I was thinking, are you crazy? Do I want to pitch in the All-Star game? I said, yeah, absolutely, I want to pitch. I, I pretty much knew I wasn't going to have a chance to start. I mean, I did have the most wins in the major leagues, but, you know, made for TV, didn't really want to see Kent Bottomfield against Pedro Martinez. They want to see, I think, Schilling started that game, and then Johnson came in after that. Obviously, very deserving players. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, I got a chance to come into that game and I faced some great players. I got booed. Now, I'm maybe one of the only players to ever get booed in the All-Star game because I hit Cal Ripken. 
uh, not intentionally. I'd faced him a lot of times in spring training, being in West Palm Beach, and they were down in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and I knew to pitch him in, and I just, but one of the unwritten rules, I guess, in the game used to be you don't do that, and I one got away, and I guess that's why. So I got booed at the All-Star game. Uh, walked a guy or two. I can just remember being, being kind of tired, uh, but so excited. It was a weird combination. Um, but I, I would like to point out, I think in the record it says I have gave up two earned runs, and if that go back, there's only one earned run. And uh, I don't know who to talk to, but, you know, who cares? Yeah, it was great. a great experience. Shows one error here. Two runs, one hit, one error. Uh, Tome, you walked. Ripken hit by pitch. Uh, Palmero singled, struck out uh, Pudge Rodriguez. Alomar reached on an error, E5, in case you want to know who it was, their baseman. Yeah, Matt Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Former teammate. Yeah. Wonderful guy. Kenny Lofton flew out, and then uh, Jeter struck out. Well, uh, I guess that's where I had. There was a ball hit that McGuire. That's the other thing in the All-Star game, guys, who are kind of, not that they don't play hard, but there's, I played with him all year long, and when there's a play you know he can make. Right. It just, and it's no big deal. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a good time. Um, honestly, you want to win the game, and especially the way it's gone the last, what, 10 years now? Yeah. Man almighty. Um, but it was just a, those three days were a blur. They, it's, it's like they just flew by so fast. Right. Um, and it took me a while to realize what had happened. Uh, but I've seen the game, I've always watched the game on video twice in the last six years or seven years since it happened. Um, but just real. All factor, I mean, you did walk in and you do see the, the stars of the game. Oh. Even though you see them periodically during the season, I mean, they're all congregated. Well, you, you just think about the, what you just named yeah. right there, right down the line. Uh, you're talking about everybody's number three and four hitters, uh, mostly. Uh, so, absolutely, and and especially going against the American League, and and yes, we had interleague play at that time, but you're still not facing a lot of these guys. So you're you're going on instinct. Well, my success came from knowing hitters and watching video. It didn't come from having a 98 mile an hour fastball where I could just throw by people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was interesting for me. Piazza was catching me. Who. I was glad that he was finally on my team because he was probably the toughest hitter I ever faced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I know he knew some of the hitters. He'd been in different all-star games. Uh, but I just, I wouldn't have traded and, and I wouldn't have cared. I would have cared. But if I'd have given up five or six runs, the point was I was there with the best of the best. It was an incredible couple days and uh, something that I'll never forget. And I get a chance to, to show my son and my daughters. Um, and it was just amazing time. Well, it's a tremendous cachet. You also were part of both the 98-99 Cardinals and the Mark McGuire show. Just to be, talk to me about And the mark that experience. I mean, it was, you know, incredibly exciting for the fan. It was. Well, the players became fans. Yeah. I mean, it, it almost became unfair to Mark in the sense, as a teammate, you felt like that any time he was up to bat, the ball was going to go out, and that's that's quite a lot of pressure to put on any one individual. But the fact of the matter is, for a lot of guys uh, that might fly out on a pitch, that same pitch, you know, he's hitting 10, 20 feet further. Uh, so he has a chance to even miss a ball and hit it out of the ballpark. Uh, I thought he handled it very well. Uh, in 98, we had, I, I can't even tell you how much press that was yeah. from around the world in our, in our not so big club mark in the sense. As a teammate, you felt like that any time he was up to bat, the ball was going to go out. And that's, that's quite a lot of pressure to put on any one individual. But the fact of the matter is, for a lot of guys uh, that might fly out on a pitch that same pitch you know he's hitting 10 20 feet further uh, so he has a chance to even miss a ball and hit it out of the ballpark uh, I thought he handled it very well uh, in 98 we had I, I can't even tell you how much press that we had from around the world in our in our not so big clubhouse in, in St. Louis and I thought he did a great job I, I never saw him lose it I mean everywhere we would go I mean police escorts they'd want autographs uh, 
teams would send over at the beginning of a homestand, he'd have a hundred things to sign for other teams. And, and he always made it clear, send over what you want, but make sure it's here. I'll sign it on the last day. And he was signing balls and jerseys and pictures and bats. And I mean, he had a table set up, all this stuff just for other players from other teams. Yeah. Uh, and so I thought he did a great job. And at the end of the year, <coughs> I was coming in on an off day for some treatment, a leg situation I had. And he was there, and on the ping pong table that was in the clubhouse were boxes of, of balls, dozen balls dozens of them and he was signing and what he did is he signed a dozen balls for every teammate every coach every kid that worked in the clubhouse as his way of saying thank you for putting up with all this stuff this year uh, so I thought he did a tremendous job uh, handling it but he just had sometimes he had to hide in the clubhouse and go where front office people weren't allowed to go because there was always a request and I and they handled them with respect but still even as nice as you can be if you got people coming up to you every 10 minutes, this show or this or that or that, uh, it can be tough, but I thought he did a great job. When he breaks the mark, how, how high did you jump? Uh, to me, I think that the, the most incredible moment was the night that he tied it. Right. Because you're, you're just anticipating, you're waiting, all this buildup, and you know he's going to break it. Right. Uh, but just, just when he tied it, uh, I, I thought that I thought the electricity in, in the air was much greater than the day that he broke it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a sense of relief for everybody. And to him, and he said this in interviews a lot, and I can tell you being there firsthand, he wasn't, he wasn't lying about it. He wasn't, his goal wasn't to break the record. And I, I think if his goal was to break the record, I don't think he would have. His focus was on getting the best swings he could, and he was also a great student of the game. Uh, he knew pitchers. And uh, so his focus wasn't breaking the record, but once it was broken, you could tell he was a little relieved. I think a little bit the way Barry is now, I think he's relieved. Now he's starting to hit more home runs, and, um, and, and Mark fell along the same category. Obviously, he ended up that year with 70. Yeah. Um, but I thought the night he tied it was, was a greater moment than when he actually. When Sosa came to town and the, you were playing the Cubs, uh, what was that like? Well, I mean, there was, the chase was on. The, the chase was on, and I had been a teammate of, of Sammy's for the two years previous to that, 96 and 97. Um, it, was, it was nuts. I mean, that's a great series anyway. You, know, you talk about Dodgers, Giants, you talk about Yankees, Boston, and, and these rivalries. But the Cubs, Cardinal, it's a rivalry, but it's a, it's a fun rivalry. And you don't have guys beating each other up in the stands and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I can remember my first experience. I was with the Cubs and we were in St. Louis and I was a reliever at that time and I was back in the clubhouse doing something and I heard, I heard him going crazy out in the stands. I thought, man, I better get out there. Something's gone on. Somebody's hit a home run for Cardinals. I might have to get up. And I get out there and it was Sammy that had hit a home run. And the thing is there were just as many Cub fans in St. Louis as there were Cardinal fans. And the same thing happened in Chicago. And it was, uh, so it was a fun, very fun rivalry. And uh, just all the players, all the good players that have gone back and forth between those two teams. Right. Um, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was nuts. I mean, the amount of media doubled because the ones that had been following Sammy, now they were all in town following both. Right. Uh, and there were people sitting in the aisles, uh, special permission with tickets. Uh, it just, as far as media, uh, I, I've never seen anything like it. Do you guys kind of feel left out, or you just feel to be proud of the moment? I mean, I can only speak for myself. Uh, all the attention that he was getting didn't bother me. It didn't bother me to have the media hanging out in the clubhouse and all that. It wasn't a big deal to me. It was fun to see, uh, just because he was, you know, I felt at the time he was approaching it with such, such pure motives. You know, it wasn't, he was never a hey, look at me kind of guy. He didn't like all that stuff. I mean, he just, he wanted to play baseball. Um, he didn't care if people recognized his milestone, and he, he had many of them in those two years. Uh, I think first player to hit 50 home runs four years in a row, I think, was one of them. Just different things like that. Uh, so it was, it was fun. You really kind of get behind a guy like that because of his attitude about the whole thing. Uh, Is he getting a fair shake now? I mean, they just went through his first Hall of Fame ballot and didn't fare well. Um, do you think that's that's appropriate? To, you know, however, he got there. The whole steroid situation right. and Celia's cast a 
a shadow <laughs> over what is otherwise incredible statistic. Mm -hmm. I've been very open about my thoughts on, on the whole steroid issue, um, just simply because uh, of the facts. I mean, the things that we we see and we know, and we know right now the question with a guy like Barry Bonds or Gary Sheffield is, did they actually know what they were taking? And I, and I guarantee you they knew what they were taking. Mm -hmm. Players aren't that stupid. That, that's just, they'd like to pretend they are, but they're not. Um, you don't, as a highly trained athlete, you don't just do something because a trainer says, okay, do it. You want to know what's going on. Um, with Mark, I can say that I never saw uh, anything go on, but I can't, it's not like I can defend him when he got in front of Congress and his statement, uh, it made no sense to me. Right. Uh, it was something like, if I say that I didn't do it, nobody would believe me. If I say that I did, uh, then I put family and people in jeopardy and ridicule and positions of ridicule. And I, I thought, you know, bottom line is, if you didn't take it, just say, I didn't do it. And uh, for some reason, he felt like he couldn't say that. Why? My sense is that he knows what he did. That's, that's my sense. Um, the people that were in the organization from Oakland uh, would swear up and down uh, because it was, you know, the controversy was there while he was going through this. And uh, guys have been with him for years, they swear up and down, no, never, he never did it, this, that, and the other. But I just wonder why you can't answer that in front of Congress. And I think it just leads me, along with probably lots of other people and people who are voting for the Hall of Fame, to think the same thing. Rafael Palmero said he didn't, and look where he's at. Right. Well, Mark isn't on record as saying anything. Um, will he eventually make it? I don't know. I know there's a lot of writers that are upset about that whole situation. I don't know if that goes away with time. Probably a lot of it depends on what happens with, with Barry Bonds. If he gets off with nothing, uh, then I think probably more than likely Mark will have a chance to make it to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can only judge it like everybody else, and that was his answer in Congress. Why didn't you just come out and say no? I know if I was in that situation, and I haven't talked to him about it or anything since then. I haven't seen him. Um, but if it was me, I, I would just give the simple answer. Absolutely not. I did not. Um, that's just me. I'm very disappointed about the cloud that is over the game. Mm -hmm. And I get tons of questions about it. And, and uh, one of them is, well, what if this is just the era where so many people are doing it, does it really matter? And bottom line, yeah, it matters. It's cheating. I don't care if, if uh, out of the 800 players, if 799 of them are doing it, uh, it it's cheating. And what bothers me the most, uh, baseball, especially as a young guy coming up and getting to the major leagues, there's such a fine line between success and failure and actually making it or getting sent back down. But I wonder how many younger players' careers hinged on the fact that this guy just hit a home run off me in a key situation. And uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about big names. There are all kinds of other guys that, that hit 30 home runs that should have only been hitting 10, uh, you know, did that affect a player's career? Maybe not just that game, but it's such a mental game that maybe that sent that pitcher into a, a dive for a week, and, and that was the last chance he got. Yeah. So I think about it from those terms, too, because I was one of those players. I didn't come up and have great success right off the bat. Um, you know, a bad week for me meant looking over my shoulder to see who was coming up to take my place. Uh, so I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, so, like I said, if, if there was only one guy that wasn't taking them, it's, it, it's still cheating and affected the lives of many. Um, and I don't think we've even scratched the surface and probably will never know uh, really how many guys were taking it. But I can tell you the numbers, they weren't quite Jose Canseco numbers. And I haven't read his book, but I heard they were pretty large as far as percentage. Mm -hmm. but, but they were, it was a big number. Yeah. Talk about sensitivities. You had a, I mean, the, the career year. And the next thing you know, you're traded off <laughs> to the Angels for Jim Edmonds. What's that do for your psyche? That was tough for me. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, I, and I knew, I knew that it was a good trade for the Cardinals. Uh, and I knew it was for Anaheim, too. And I'm not saying because uh, I thought that much of myself, but also with Adam Kennedy in the deal, who went on to be MVP of the American League Championship Series in whatever year, 2000. So I knew it was a good deal for both sides. Uh, I was excited because we were starting to bring in pitching. I mean, that offseason, we'd signed Daryl Kyle and, and Andy Bennis and Pat Hankton. And I thought, this is what we've been missing. We, I think we finished uh, 
In 99, I think we finished 11 or 12 games under 500. Well, the biggest problem was pitching. And so I thought, yeah, we're going to have a staff here. And then with, I guess, about 10 days to go, uh, getting the phone call, I was at home, and, I mean, in spring training, I was at my house, and, and I got the phone call from Walt Jockety. And when he called me, I can, I, you know, basically I said hello, and that was the last word I said. He went through the whole thing, and I was in shock. And I think I might have said, uh-huh, at the end, and, and then we hung up. And probably 10, 15 minutes later, um, the beat writer called me. And I just, I was in tears. I, I couldn't even talk. And I just said, you know, Rick, I'll have to come tomorrow morning and answer everybody's questions. I just, I can't talk right now. Very difficult for me. Um, there was some fear going over to the American League. There was a lot of expectations. I mean, you get traded for Jim Edmonds. I mean, come on. Uh, but I, I don't know if I totally felt that pressure, but you knew that the eyes were on you. Uh, and everybody was all about, oh, he had one good year and, and this, that, and the other. So I got there. One of my favorite coaching staffs, if not my favorite of all time, Mike Sosha was incredible. Bud Black, just amazing. Just the whole staff from top to bottom. Uh, I knew Mike would do something. I didn't know he'd win a World Series that quickly. But he was so he was so incredibly knowledgeable of the game, and he could relate to his players and walk that fine line that you have to between having the respect of a manager and being a friend of a player. Uh, he was amazing at that. Um, but it was it was good, and things started out well. Uh, the first month, I was in the lead uh, in the top ten in the league in different categories in pitching, and then injuries started taking their toll, which actually had started the last couple weeks or three weeks of my '99 season. I missed my last two starts in St. Louis, and my chance to win 20 games. Uh, my last game against Chicago, I was having some issues where we got into about the fourth inning, and every time I throw a pitch where my hand wasn't directly behind the ball, so I'd change up a curveball or a slider, I would feel a weakness in my shoulder. And I informed them of that after the game was over. They sent me back to St. Louis to get some tests done. And they suggested, uh, after the test, they said I had severe tendonitis and suggested that I, mi I miss the rest of the season. Uh, I only had two starts to go with a chance to win 20 games. My first thought is, they don't want to pay me if I win 20 games. But the man that I trusted the most in that organization was Dave Duncan, <clears throat> and he was in that meeting, and I asked him what he thought, and he said, well, if you, and I was close to him, and he said, if you were my son, I would suggest that you not. Uh, their fear, or so they said, was that if I was to pitch those two games, it might set me back so I couldn't start the season next year. I felt like I had, I was going to have more chances to win 20 games, not just because of my ability, but like I said, the way guys played behind me and that whole attitude. So I agreed. And it was the next two games were against the Cubs and the Padres, and I pitched well against both those teams. Uh, at least that year I did. And uh, a tough decision for me. Uh, so then when I go to Anaheim, these things start creeping up again about six weeks into the season or so, and uh, go on the DL for a couple weeks, come back, and I'm just never the same. Uh, I get traded to Philadelphia. Um, it was nice to get back to the National League. Uh, and pitched so-so there, did throw my only shutout in my major league career, and that was actually against the Cardinals in St. Louis, which that was a big moment for me. Sure. Uh, but there's still something going on on my shoulder. Uh, I didn't think it was terribly serious, but I had the offseason to rest, came back to Houston, and uh, had the best spring of my life. Uh, I wasn't throwing very hard, and that was commented on several times, but the numbers were good. I was pitching well. I uh, started having issues again once the season started. Once again, tendonitis was the uh, and the same thing they said in Anaheim, tendonitis, tendonitis. And uh, finally, after three months of rehabilitation, I go to a double A game and start out throwing 91, 92. And then within 15, 20 pitches, it goes back down to 80, 81. And I just told them I'm not going to get back on a mound until somebody goes in there. And they did, and it was severe. I mean, I had a, a muscle uh, in, in my rotator cuff torn completely in half, and I had a biceps tendon which attached to the labrum was torn off completely. Uh, who knows how long I've been pitching with it? I don't know. There wasn't a severe amount of pain, but what the problem was, I couldn't control anything. I mean, here I'd build a career, and especially the previous four years, on control. And I'm throwing, trying to throw a pitch down and away, and 75% of the time it's in the middle of the plate, or it's coming in, or it's up, which happens sometimes, but it, not that often. Uh, so I knew there was an issue, and the pain didn't really come until after I was done pitching, and then it would hurt badly. 
But I figured, hey, if it doesn't hurt when I'm pitching, it must be mechanical. Sure. Uh, so when they went in there and found that, it answered a lot of questions for me. Uh, coming out of surgery, they didn't give me much chance of ever returning to the mound. Uh, I think they told me like 25%. And I tried. For a year, I tried very hard to do that, and it, it just couldn't make it happen. Did that test your faith? It did, um, and not from the sense of, uh, it wasn't from the sense of why God, why are you allowing this to happen. It, it was, I was accepting the fact that it was happening to me, not that I wanted it to, but it was like, it really woke me up to how, you know, what my heart was all about. You know, how am I, get, how am I dealing with this? Okay, I've been a major leaguer for nine seasons professionally for 16 years we're looking at a chance that this is over mm -hmm. um, what did that mean to me how was I going to deal with that how was I dealing with just even the thoughts of of it was over in my mind it, it wasn't I mean I was going to beat those odds and and so for a year I knew I was going to get back in the game and uh, so it tested my faith in the sense that it tested me Kent are you going to align yourself with what God is allowing to happen right now or are you going to continue to fight this and that didn't mean uh, rehabbing was fighting it. Mm -hmm. uh, rehabbing is something I felt like I had a responsibility to do. God gave me the gift to throw a baseball, and I was going to do everything I could to make sure I could do that as long as he allowed me to do it. Uh, but it was, are you going to fall in line with what God's allowing to happen in your life and accept the fact that this may be the end of the road in baseball for you? Uh, that was tough. There were a lot of tough things I had to answer and, and deal with in my own heart and some of the ugliness. Um, but it was a it was a tough thing to walk through. Fortunately, you know, I worked as hard as I could at the game, but I always tell people that baseball is not who I was. It's what I did. And so when I got out of the game, there was still more to my life than baseball. So, yeah, there was an empty spot, but it wasn't like this huge gaping uh, void. Uh, I still I was, a, a, I was, still am a family man. I had an interest in music. I had an interest in just ministering in different ways and going out and speaking and, and talking to people. And so uh, God just transitioned me from one season to the next uh, in my life and uh, there are parts and times that I miss the game. I'll never get that kind of competition uh, out on the mound. I mean it was the best of the best in this in this world and I'm not going to find that anywhere else. Uh, I'm just not good enough to compete at that level in anything else. Uh, so that part I do miss but there are a lot of advantages to being out of the game now after spending so much time in it and a lot of that is really family and having the flexibility to be with my family and sometimes that sounds like a stock answer but I mean it's true I mean I I missed them tremendously when I was on the road so much and all the pressures and things that came along with the game uh, I still am on the road a fair amount but at least I can choose when I'm on the road they can come with me whenever possible uh, so it's different uh, but it was an interesting time I, I mean, to say the least, and God taught me a lot through it and uh, still teaching me. Did you ever think you'd be in a position where you're a nationally acclaimed recording artist? I mean, at some point there is a segue to that <coughs> career that you just talked about, and did you think you were good enough to get to this? Uh, you know, no, uh, but, but that wasn't my goal. You know, as a as a young boy playing baseball, my goal was to become a Major League Baseball player. Mm -hmm. So I always had my sights set on that. When I retired from the game and got into music, I actually went into it reluctantly. I originally started out by buying into a recording studio and I was writing for other people, singing background vocals. I didn't want this out front. I didn't want to be out there, quote unquote, performing. I didn't feel like that was me. I felt like I could have just as good of a ministry writing meaningful songs that people put on their projects or did in concert. And uh, when, when we were doing that, and for a year, every artist would ask me the same question. You ever, have you done your own CD? And I kept the same answer. No, I don't want to. I love doing this. Didn't like the spotlight as a player. I didn't want to jump back into it doing something else. And God just kept pounding away. And finally, my wife, after a year, she said, Ken, I think Ken, that God is calling you to get into this as an artist. And I knew what that took for her to say that. Uh, I'd been home almost every night for two years at that point, and she knew that I was going to jump into it and try to be the best that I could be to glorify God with it. And that meant back out on the road, uh, all these things. 
and so it took a lot for her to say that. Uh, she knew she was going to go back to a lot of times being a single mom, and she's never complained about that. She does a great job with the kids. Um, and so that was kind of the final point for me. I knew with her saying it, that's what I was supposed to do. But my goal was, and still is, is to minister to people. Mm -hmm. I want to, and I'll say it tonight, I want to encourage those who know Christ, and I want to introduce them to those who don't. That's what I've set out to do. And I tell everybody that works for me when they first come on board, whether it's publicist, radio promoter, management, you name it, I tell them, listen, I'll work as hard as any artist you've ever had or harder. So my goal is not to sell a million CDs. My goal is to reach as many people as I can for Christ. If that means God is going to allow me to sell tons of CDs, then hey, hallelujah, we're going to reach more people because the gospel message is actually on my CDs. Uh, if it means being in front of 10 or 20,000, hey, great. But if it means being in front of 100 or 1,000 and, and selling a smaller amount of CDs, I don't care. I, I'm going to do what I've been called to do, and I'm going to allow God to take care of the rest. If he wants me in front of all those people, then I'll do it. If he doesn't, then I'll do it. And I'm going to be just as content. My message doesn't change. Uh, what I've been called to do doesn't change. Uh, I'll work hard, but uh, if I never have a number one on radio, uh, then there's a reason for that, um, and I'm okay with that. So my goal wasn't to make it to the big leagues in music, and, uh, and by no means have I anyway. Uh, it's just, it's a ministry to me. I go out and do it and allow God to do what he wants to do with it. Are, are the lyrics uh, the, the back, in, back in the game, is that autobiographical? It is. Uh, my producer, we were sitting in the studio one day, and he said, have, have you ever written a song about baseball? And uh, I said, have you ever written a song about music? And he thought for a minute, and, his, and, and he knew what I was saying. It's like, you know, I've been doing baseball for so long. Uh, I wanted to separate myself from it for one main reason. I wanted people to take the ministry of the music as being legitimate. We've seen all kinds of former athletes or current athletes do CDs or go out and sing and this, that, and the other and do national anthems. And we've heard some pretty interesting songs. So I didn't want baseball to be an obstacle, so I tried to stem it from it. And then a friend approached me uh, probably a year and a half ago or so, and he said, what if God only used baseball and the success that you had so that he could use it in music today? And I never thought of that. I looked at them as, as two totally separate deals. And then I started thinking, you know, I still don't throw baseball out there as the main thing and don't flaunt it all over the place. But God does use baseball. He still does. People will come to concerts or come to churches that would never set foot at a Christian concert inside of a church, but they have a ball or a jersey or something they want signed, and I have the opportunity to share the gospel. Uh, so that song is really a culmination of all those things, and it's basically saying my purpose in the game of baseball was to reach people for Christ. My purpose in music is exactly the same. It's the vehicle in which I do it now is different. Now it's music instead of baseball. So I'm back in the game. Uh, Doing, but my, my purpose, I'm, I'm back in the game doing the same thing I was in baseball, just doing it. Your teammates uh, push back at all and saying, oh gosh, can, or did, did they, they've been supportive? How, what's, what's been the reaction of some of your players? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's like anything else. Since I wasn't running around the clubhouse singing when I was playing, nobody had any idea <laughs> that I could, could sing. And so I think it's the same uh, initial response I get. When I stand in front of an audience, you can tell some people are just anticipating, some people are a little nervous, they're wondering what's going to happen. And I get that from, from some former teammates, but I was just in Philadelphia this last week doing a faith night at the ballpark, and John Smoltz was one of the guys that was sharing his testimony. He, and I knew John from playing against him in spring trainings, and, and uh, he, was, he was floored. He didn't know that I had, was singing, didn't know what I was doing now. I kind of fell off the face of the earth when it came to baseball. No big stories on ESPN about my retirement or anything. Uh, but he he just he couldn't believe it. And I mean that in a good good sense. Uh, so I, it's just one of those things, once I overcome the obstacle with people, and it's still once in a while an obstacle, and they realize that there is some legitis legitimacy behind the ministry, I can sing a little bit, um, then they start to understand, you know, this really is about the ministry, and this is what he's focused on. And, and so it, it it's becoming less and less that I have to overcome that, but it's still out there, and it will always, to an extent, still be there. Did you see Tim Laker yesterday? 
I didn't talk to him, but I, I saw him. I came by the game for a couple of innings last night and saw him, yeah. yeah. And your paths would have crossed with him at the Expos? The Expos, yep. Yeah. The Expos, yeah. And Tim was here also. When the day is done, <laughs> what's the legacy of, uh, uh, that you'd like to leave? I mean, you, you're young now, but 30 years from now when you decide that this is, you know, you're on, onto something else, or, or what, what's, what do they want people to remember you by? You know, I don't look at it in terms as much of that. You know, I look at, at my family, and I want my children to know that I'm the same person with them as I am with everybody else. I think sometimes uh, people fall into a habit, and, and we all can, that we're different to those who aren't so close to us. Uh, and I've seen that too much in my lifetime. I, I want my kids to know that uh, I don't treat other people any better than I treat them. I'm the same man I am to everybody because that's what God calls me to be. So that would be the, the, the legacy that I want to leave to m my children and let them know that God's, uh, God's calling in our life supersedes our own desires. And not that they don't match up because right now with the music, uh, they definitely are for me. Um, but as far as anybody outside my family, I don't look at leaving a legacy. I, I want my God to remember me as, as he remembered Job. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he can say those words about me just yet, but in upright and blameless. But that's, that, that's the legacy I want to have with my God. And so I strive for that. And so when I'm out there, I'm not out there to leave a legacy for people. I'm out there to leave uh, a piece of God wherever I go. And hopefully people see his incredible love and his mercy and the grace that he showed to, shows to us every day and what he showed to us through the cross. And uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that to me, that's a legacy. Well, you're the real deal. I'm delighted you're in Jamestown, New York, Kent, for lots of reasons. Well, I'm, I'm excited. This is the first time I've come back to, uh, and I know I didn't actually play the season here, but it's the first time I've been back to a place that, that I played. I mean, I was in Expo, and I was here for a couple of weeks, and, and so it's fun for me to come back and, and see the place after, wow, twenty some years. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's fun for me, and I'm looking forward to tonight. Oh, great. Thank you. Bye.